welcome to the Speakeasy Sports Show. Time to pull up a seat, pour a glass, and talk some ball. Here's your hosts, Daniel and John. What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Speakeasy Sports Show. I am Daniel. He is John. Uh, and it's been too long, John. It's been too long since we got on here for the good people. Uh, it's been since Michigan crowned themselves national champions. That was the last time we recorded, taking a nice little break. But lest you thought you were rid of us, we are back for um, lots of stuff this offseason. We got a lot of things planned, and we're really excited about it. John, uh, how have you been? How have you been recovering from the post-NCAA tournament post national championship game we made it through football season we made it through basketball season are you are you hanging in there how's it going i'm hanging, I'm hanging in there it's been uh honestly you know i had a really had a really good break um d- did a lot of self-care yeah. um <laughs> watch <laughs> i'm kidding no self-care <laughs> no. um for me no for me i I've, I've really been enjoying i've really i've gone deep into college baseball which has been really exciting we're gonna um, have to talk a little college baseball yeah, we will talk show. a little college baseball we've got conference tournaments starting mm-hmm. uh starting this week yeah um, got, the, the got regional the regionals, yeah. yeah i got the regionals coming all that stuff and so college baseball has been extremely exciting and uh you know and now we're we're dipping into uh a little bit of off-season content with college football so i'm excited to be back on the mics yeah, so let's do spring practices behind us. If you're a fan of college football, um, things are really starting to ramp up now. And this offseason, unlike any other, John, I feel like college football fans are getting it a little bit early because I'm not sure if you're aware, but on July 19th, um, so a lot of people are calling in sick from work. So if you're not planning on calling in sick from work on July 19th and you don't know what I'm talking about, good for you. Somebody's got to keep this country moving. But I will be calling in sick from work on July 19th. And I feel like college football fans with the video game coming out, the anticipation of the fall, it's kind of at an all time high. A lot of conference realignment is taken into effect. The brand new Big Ten. You got Texas and Oklahoma joining the SEC. You got you know, you got the Big 12 and the ACC hanging on and like there's so much intrigue, 12 team playoff. There's so much about this season of college football in particular. So let's just jump in with a little off the bat. We're going to go top five, our own speakeasy sports show, top five, um, top five teams in the country. If we if there's going to be a national champion, we think it's going to come. We think more likely than not it's going to come from this list today. And so um, let's jump in. John, who do you, who do we have as the number one team in all of college football heading in to the 2024-25 football season? Daniel, um I you know, I've I debated a lot around the number one team to be honest because I do think that this is a this is a season coming into this college football season where things are there is a little bit more uh, intrigue around the top of this of top of the rankings, right? Mm-hmm. Um cuz you got what what uh, teams have done around the country with roster management, with the transfer portal, sure. um, with you know uh, qu- starting quarterbacks being their second, third year developing, all those types of things. Um, but you know, I will say uh, I'm going to have to go with Georgia, the Georgia Bulldogs, as the number one team coming out of spring. And I think for Georgia, I think there's really three reasons why they hmm. are my post spring number one. Um, first of all, they had the best coach in college football, um, Kirby Smart. Not it and. And people talk about Kirby Smart's, you know, his his ability to recruit talent, which I think is just incredible. The way that he manages the roster is incredible. Um, but mostly, uh, you know, Kirby Smart is the number one coach in college football by my standards because of the consistency. Mm. This is a guy who he has a program that is well established. He has a program that is very consistent, does not have a lot of turnover on his coaching staff. And when he does have turnover on his staff, he is bringing in guys that have a similar philosophy, a similar background to really keep that machine running. And so um, you saw it this offseason with Will Muschamp leaving Georgia. He brought in uh, Travaris Robinson from Alabama, who was on staff with Will Muschamp for years and years um, has a similar philosophy on the defensive side of football. So I think number one, the consistency of Kirby smart, how he builds his program, his coaching staff, his talent. 
Number two, Georgia returns a lot of production, most notably Carson Beck, who was uh, through for almost 4,000 yards last year, 72% completions. And and Georgia, you know, is um, extremely deep where it matters, especially on the offensive line. Georgia goes about eight deep yeah. uh, on the offensive line. So if you think about health in this long slog of a season, um, I think, uh, you know, the talent on the team, the depth of the team, the coaching of the team. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the only thing that gives me pause is really this is, you know, this is a post spring number one. Um, we'll see how it goes when you go. You have to go to Texas. You have to go to Alabama. You have to go to Ole Miss. You even go. You have this weird trap game early in the season, the third game of the season. We were playing at Kentucky. I mean, it's a it's a it's a murderer's row of a schedule. And so I think Georgia will find out uh, who they are really quick. Yeah, I absolutely think if you're making a list of favorites to win conferences, favorites to make the playoff, you you should consider schedule. But if you're making if you're making a rankings of best teams in the country, schedule's got to be thrown out the window. You can't consider that because just because a team might have more losses doesn't mean that they're not uh, a, a better overall football team. Um, well, you got Georgia at number one. To me, it makes number two a really easy decision, and I think it's Ohio State. <clears throat> and I actually think it's Ohio State by a decent berth compared to the third, the number three team that we'll talk about in a second. And I think when you talk about Ohio State, you talk about really two things. One, Ohio State, I'm going to upset Ohio State fans by saying something nice about them, which is sort of like my hidden, like my specialty, really. Like I could make you mad even when I'm talking good about your team. You ready, Ohio State fans? Brace yourselves. Ohio State is kind of the Michigan of this year. Um, In And here's what I mean by that. Michigan last year returned about 80 percent of their of their production they brought everybody back off that team which was why jim harbaugh and michigan were you know heavy favorites to win the big 10 again and to go on and to make the college football playoff which they obviously did and then won um you look at ohio state this year quarterback notwithstanding Mm -hmm. They return a ton of really experienced, really key players. I think people get caught up in the Marvin Harrisons, you know, of the world that that leave the program. But so many key players, both on the offensive and the defensive side of the line, that defensive front for Ohio State is as good as anywhere in college football, including Georgia, probably better than Georgia on paper. And so you look at. The returning production, I think it's hard not to like Ohio State, but here's the real reason I like Ohio State. And I don't think this is being talked about nearly enough. Yes, everyone's going to talk about the quarterback situation. They bring in Will Howard. He's competing. You know, there's some recruits on campus. Who's going to win the job? Is it going to be Will Howard? Is it going to be somebody else? I don't care about any of that. And if I'm an Ohio State fan, I don't care about any of that. Do you know why? Because the most important move that I think any team made this entire offseason was that Ohio State brought in Chip Kelly as their offensive coordinator. Mm -hmm. And not only is Chip Kelly one of the best offensive minds in college football, one of the most innovative minds in college football, not only is he doing what he is created to do, which is just to focus on and manipulate an offense in order to score points and utilize talent. He's, he's as good as that at anybody as anybody in the country, but you don't think Chip Kelly is going to be coaching with a proverbial boulder on his shoulder this year, John, like you don't think that this man, and if there's anybody that, that you know is going to hold a grudge, that you know is going to come out try to prove everyone wrong, that you know is just chomping at the bit to get out there and let the people say what they've been saying about him and then to come out and dominate at Ohio State. It's Chip Kelly. Like the guy is as petty in a good way as you could possibly want a coach to be. Mm -hmm. And I think to get the Ohio State offense – out of the hands that it has been in of mm-hmm. Ryan Day and to get it into the hands of Chip Kelly, I think is going to make all the difference in the world. The Buckeyes have consistently failed to get over the hump in recent years. I don't think that's going to be the case anymore because of that single move in the offseason. And so I really like Ohio State coming in at two. 
Yeah. And I think, you know, to your point with Chip Kelly, um, I think, you know, people don't haven't been believers in Ryan Day. Myself was, have, has been one of them. And I think part of part of the thing that you that you want to see if you're an Ohio State fan is growth in Ryan Day as a head coach moving into an actual uh, more of that, you know, kind of CEO program, you know, leader role, getting out of his offensive coordinator mindset and giving the reins to somebody who can utilize the personnel in a way that, you know, Ryan Day just um, he hasn't been able to do consistently in those games like Michigan, the Michigan game specifically, yeah. um, I think is one of those. And so, yeah, I, I think it's I agree with you. I think it's a huge move for Ohio State. Hard to argue with them being at two. Um Daniel, number three, we'll, we'll move to number three on yeah. our list, the Speakeasy Sports Show post-spring uh, top five. And we're going to go to Steve Sarkeesian and the Texas Longhorns. Um, I was not a Steve Sarkeesian believer. Yep. I'll just say it. Um, Steve Sarkeesian, you can look at it. You can look at his history and and he has um, underwhelmed in, you mm-hmm. know, just about everywhere that he's been as a head coach when it comes to big games, when it comes to, um, you know, really taking taking his team and his program to the next level. What he did last year at Texas was he actually proved that, number one, he can win. And he can win, you know, he won at Alabama most notably, but he can win uh, big games. Um, Number two, he can build culture that actually is, you know, is a – uh, that matches the Texas fan base, which is very hard to do. Yeah, very hard. I mean, it's been a long time since the Texas football team has matched the um, the the ego of the of the Texas fan base. Yeah, um, but Sarkeesian was able to do it last year. Um, and number three, what he's done is is he brings back uh, fifteen starters on this team. So he has six starters on offense, eight starters on defense, and then the kicker named Auburn um, is is coming back. And so I I think you know. That returning production, Quinn Ewers, um, and his ability to, you know, if if he can stay healthy, I think is going to be the key thing for Texas um, this year. You know, I know Texas fans are high on Arch Manning, but I think if, if Quinn Ewers, if he can stay healthy with with coming into the SEC, the gauntlet um, uh, that they're going to play, you know, I think I think the sky's the limit for Texas. I have him at number three. I think they also did a, a really good job in filling gaps in the portal. They lost. Um, Ad Mitchell and Xavier Worthy, but they fill they fill them with guys like Isaiah Bond. Um, you know that that defensive line, defensive front is going to be stout again, and so I think Texas is uh, is set to uh, to make another run here. Yeah, Texas fans, do yourself a favor. Stop wishing Arch Manning would play ahead of Quinn Ewers. <laughs> You're doing fine. You're doing just fine with doing the quarterback fine. that you have. Um, well, I may catch a lot of heat for this, but I, I think it is silly to not see the comparisons between 2017 Georgia and 2023 Texas, right? Like, I think it's pretty silly. Like you're talking about a sleeping giant program that everyone has unanimously agreed has underachieved and should have been better consistently Mm -hmm. year in and year out than they have been. And Oh wait, all of a sudden this unproven coach that no one really believes in came through and took them darn near the promised land, almost won the whole dang thing with them. But Oh, they can't, they can't contain like or maintain that success. They can't continue to play at that level. Well, if you said that about Georgia in 2018 and beyond, you would have been absolutely dead wrong about that football team. And if you said it about, if you say it about Texas now, I just don't see any reason why this program would be going anywhere. I think Sark is it. I think he's a legit coach And I think if he keeps his head on his shoulders, which is the only thing that's really, if we're going to be honest, gotten in his way is some like personal off the field stuff, which it feels weird to talk about on a show called the Speakeasy Sports Show where we talk (laughs) about bourbon. But I digress. If he keeps his head on his shoulders, then Mm. I don't see any reason why this Texas football team will be going anywhere. By the way, if you're new to the Speakeasy Sports Show and you made it this far in the episode, subscribe. If you're a Texas fan, I just threw you all the roses you could possibly want. Subscribe to the show. If you're a fan of any of these schools, if you're a general college football, college basketball, college baseball fan, or if you're into bourbon or any of the other brown liquids in the world, um, give us a subscription. Drop a note in the comments. Let us know who your top five is. We would love to hear from you. Let's move on to number four. And um, I'm going to Dan Landing and the Oregon Ducks. Um, 
I think there's a real chance that Dan Landing might win the Big Ten in this first year. I, I think there's a real chance that this program's not going anywhere. I think that you could make the argument. Now, I'm not saying that I'm making this argument, mm. but I think that you could make the argument that Oregon upgraded at quarterback mm. when they went out and got Dylan Gabriel as opposed to Bo Nix. I know Bo Nix played outside of his mind last year. But watch what another quarterback comes in and does in that system for those coordinators. Like watch, watch how that goes this year. And then like, then we'll jump to conclusions about really how good Bo Nix was. But I think the addition of Dylan Gabriel, I think the talent that Dan Lanning has consistently brought in both in the transfer portal, you know, he goes out and gets key receivers from Texas A&M. He gets uh, key receivers, um, you know, Tez Johnson. Um, he gets uh, Jordan James. Um, like he goes in the transfer portal, but he also goes into the high school ranks. He's one of the best recruiters in the country, obviously studied under Coach Smart. And so he knows how to do all that. And then you just look at this Oregon Ducks team from top to bottom. They're just, they're built for long-term success. I don't think, I don't think you can't compare a Pac-12 schedule to a Big Ten schedule. Like you just can't do that. Like right. it's going to be a rough schedule for the Oregon Ducks. It's going to be a tough road to hope. But don't, like this Oregon team is ready for it. They are a team that is, I think, built for success. I think you look at a team like Washington, and that might be a, a drastically different story after the cupboard is literally barren um, with obviously coach departure of the head coach and a lot of people in the transfer portal as well. Um, but I think Oregon built to last. I love um, kind of the mindset of Dan Lanning this offseason. The I'm not going to Alabama, even though they very clearly offered me this job. Um, Alabama fans, be serious with yourself right be now. Serious with yourself. You offered him the job and he put out a video smoking a cigar at his home in Eugene <laughs> and just dragged you through the mud, Absolutely. which is fine. You might have your chance in the college football playoff this year to get your revenge. But um, Oregon's not going anywhere. Dan Lanning doesn't appear to be going anywhere. And the way that they work the portal, which mm. the Nike money is not going away. And so they will continue to be players in the portal. And the way Dan Lanning recruits and the way that he has brought in offensive staffers to support mm -hmm. his clearly very elite defensive mind, mm -hmm. I think it makes Oregon a team to beat for years to come. So I got him at four, um, although I will admit – I said I thought there was a pretty decent gap between Ohio State and Texas. I think there's probably an even bigger gap between Texas and Oregon. And I might argue, John, that I think there's an even bigger gap between Oregon and the next team, the last team on our list. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, I was I was going to lead up with that. I think there's there's a big drop off once you get from, you know, the top two teams, Georgia, Ohio State to Texas, big drop off from Texas to Oregon a big, big drop off from Oregon to our number five team on the speed sports show post spring top five. And that's the Alabama Crimson Tide. Um, Alabama is in one of the tougher situations in college football that any team can go through. Number one, you have a full staff transition, which is very, very hard. I mean, we saw, we've seen it, you know, um, we've seen it happen at many, many programs where uh, you lose a coach, the new staff comes in, you have to, you know, install everything, change the way you do things, all that stuff. It's very difficult. It's even more difficult when you lost the greatest coach, college football coach of all time. Um, yeah. And, and bring in a guy who has literally never sniffed um, uh, a coaching job below the Mason Dixon line. And so I think that's um, never think sniffed that's, a PO box below the Mason <laughs> Dixon yeah, line. Like never, never, never. It is a different, is a different culture, a different environment. So, but what I will say is Alabama does have enough pieces on this team. If they come together, that they can be a top five team in the country this year. Um, they mm. lost a lot to the portal, but what they didn't lose to the portal is they didn't lose guys like Jalen Milrow. They didn't lose guys like Jam Miller. 
Miller, like Justice Haynes. They didn't lose um, some of their offensive line that is actually coming together. They lost Caden Proctor and he came back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think I think this team is certainly talented enough. You have no matter who you lost to the portal in the Nick Saban kind of fiasco, fiasco retirement, you know, timing, Caleb Downs being, you know, maybe the most notable, you still have Nick Saban talent on this team. Oh, and I yeah. think, yeah, I mean, you have a lot of Nick Saban talent on this team. The question is going to be, can the coaching staff utilize the Nick Saban talent on this team? And I think Kalen DeBoer can. I mean, he's proven that he can come into a place like Washington, for example, and have a team that it wasn't his team. It wasn't his players that he recruited. Um, you know, he, he, he brought a couple of pieces with him um, and, and was able to win. And I think at Alabama, it's a similar situation. I think, I think Alabama's challenge is going to be a couple of years from now, you know, next year, the year after when you're having to refill this cupboard. But I think right now, I think Alabama has enough talent. Um, and, and when you look at the other options, right, for number five, are you going to put Ole Miss there? Are you going to put a Michigan team who's in the hundreds in returning production? Are you going to put, you know, uh, uh, Penn State there? Like it's just, there's not a lot of really good options in terms of, of number five. Um, so when that's when that's the case, you look at the talent, you look at the coaching staff that Kalen DeBoer has built, and I think Alabama is a uh, is is number five on our list. Yep. Listen, you may disagree. If that's what the comment section is for. Let us know if we are dumb, if we are wrong, if we if you cannot believe how foolish we are, um, and we would love to interact with you there. If you're if you're still with us again. If you have any interest in the show whatsoever, the the best thing you can do for us is just to subscribe. We would love that. If you would do it, tell a friend about the show, and we will be back. We got lots more off-season football, a little off-season basketball. We may talk a little Coach Cal. We haven't talked about Coach Cal. We There's a lot of things we could talk about. A little baseball, a little college baseball coverage. We got some bourbon specific episodes that are coming up. And so all of that and more um, coming your way on this feed. And we will see you guys next time.